So what had happened, let me just back up real quick for your listeners who may not know this history. So Robert Kennedy, this was the the California primary, and he was Mm -hmm. poised to win not just the primary. Well, he won the primary that night, Mm -hmm. June 4th. He won the primary. Shortly after midnight, he came down to give his acceptance speech. So that's June 5th. After the speech, he walked backstage, took a right turn, walked down a little ramp, and into this pantry area. It was like a staging area for the servers for banquets and things like that. And there were three big steam tables and a huge ice machine that covered like half a wall Mm. um, with a little space between a divider wall and the ice machine, the perfect spot to hide an assassin, by the way. And that's not where Sirhan was standing. Um, There was a tray stacker at the end of the ice machine where Sirhan was seen not alone, with a girl in a polka dot dress holding him on that stand. And I'll come back to that girl in a moment. Yes, I was about to say, <laughs> yeah. another yeah. very important part of this. Yes. Uh, anyway, Robert Keddy walks into the room. He's on his way to the colonial room, which is at the east end of the pantry and across the hall. And that's where the print media is. And this was mm. common at, at every campaign stop. He was the only one who made a point of stopping and talking to the print media because at one time, Bobby Kennedy himself was a journalist. And so he had mm. sympathy for them. Um, he's just a great guy. So anyway, he stops. You know, some busboys shake his hand. He turns to move forward. Sir Han is facing him. Sir Han pulls yes. out a gun and fires right at Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy twists to his left and falls down on the pantry floor. Uh, people grab Sir Han after the second shot and throw him into the seam table and try and keep his arm away from the crowd so he can't kill anybody else. And even so, uh, Robert Kennedy is hit four times. The big problem is Robert Kennedy was not hit from the front four times. And, and Sir Han did not get that close. And I literally made a spreadsheet. There were 77 yeah. pantry witnesses that the LAPD would allow for. I know at least uh, two others who were there, provably, that are not mm-hmm. on the list. But in general, it's a pretty comprehensive list. And I listed, like, who saw Sir Han, who saw Robert Kennedy. And then I didn't care. If they saw a gun at Kennedy's head, but they couldn't identify it as Sirhan, I threw that out because mm. I only wanted to know what the people who saw both at the same time said. That's logical, right? And guess what? <laughs> yeah, they put them two feet apart. Yes, and- that's one of the most astounding parts about your book is, is, it, yeah. is it there's you, there's so many statements that you have from witnesses mm-hmm. and so few of them can concretely say like, Yes, I you know, I saw uh, th- everyone that basically describes essentially the same scene is that Sirhan right. Sirhan several feet in front of Kennedy and nobody says he's behind him. Right, right. But there were people who saw a gunman behind Kennedy. Mm-hmm. And so that's very right. interesting. There were people who saw a gun right at Kennedy's head, but those people could not connect Sirhan or identify him as a shooter. They assumed he was the shooter. Everybody assumed when they talked to the police you know, that the person they saw was the shooter because the police kind of told them all there was one guy. So no matter who they saw and what he looked like, and whether he's tall, short, fat, thin, you know, blonde, dark haired, they all assumed they had seen Sirhan, but only a few of them actually had. So that's a huge problem. Now, uh, and and it's a problem because the autopsy report shows that Robert Kennedy was shot from not more than an inch or so behind his right ear. And they knew that because they took pig's ears and shot at them and backed up the gun until they got the right powder burn match. And at about an inch to an inch and a half is the closest it could have been. Now, there's one witness who said, oh, Sirhan lunged at Kennedy. Well, Kennedy was shot four times from behind, not once. If Sirhan lunged at Kennedy, he still like didn't get close enough to make that shot. He was in people's hands. And honestly, that didn't happen. <laughs> The guy who said that was looking at them through a camera, and he said they were just silhouettes. So somebody lunged at Kennedy, but we can't say it was Sirhan. And those who saw them both said, no, that didn't happen. So again, it's not what they often say, oh, well, witnesses just miss things. But it's not what witnesses missed. It is what they saw that precludes anything else from having happened. So just to finish what happened that night, how did Sirhan get arrested then? How did that all unfold? So, of course, he was thrown into the table and held down. And some people wanted to just kill him and choke the death out of Mm -hmm. him. And and uh, but they held him for the police. And interestingly, yeah, like we don't want another we don't want another uh, another Oswald. Oswald. Yeah, somebody yelled. 
Yes, but but here's again. So there's there's big problems. One, he couldn't have killed Kennedy just from those facts alone. Those two, he's, there's no way he could have killed Kennedy. He should be paroled on that basis. But there's much more, and that's that there were at least provably on paper in the LAPD and FBI files thirteen bullets, and Sirhan's gun mm-hmm. could only hold eight. All right, there were eight bullets that the police accounted for. Seven uh, bullets retrieved from the victims because. Two were removed from Kennedy Mm -hmm. and one each from five other shooting victims. There were three bullet holes in the ceiling. So the police said, well, one bullet went up and came back down, but a third one went up and stayed, right? Because how do you get an odd number (laughs) from, you know, from below? And so that they're out of bullets now, but the FBI photographed, and I even have video of this, there's paneling on the door frames of the doors that Kennedy walked through, these big swinging doors, you know, leading from the pantry, ultimately into the embassy room. And uh, in the center door post, there are two bullet holes. And in the far south part of the door frame, there are two more bullet holes. So now we're up to 12 bullets. And mm-hmm. then there was a, a 13th bullet that was in an AP photo the day of the, you know, right after the shooting with Mm -hmm. two police officers pointing at it. And the caption says the bullet is still in the hole. That bullet was in the back of the stage door that Kennedy had come out of. It was directly in line with a shot from the pantry, but it was slightly up a slope. And that's why it was Mm -hmm. kind of at the bottom of it, but it would have been kind of level with where the steam table was. So, Easily 13 shots, and we haven't even talked about an audio tape that also found 13 shots, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's uh, there's news articles about that, too. Yeah, and I don't like to talk about the audio tape because, to me, that is something that can be subject to interpretation, mm-hmm. and different scientists are going to disagree as to what constitutes a bullet shot, although my favorite – is in uh, Mel Eiton's book where he has an expert who says it was all Sirhan. I found seven shots for sure and three possible locations for the eighth shot. (laughs) In other words, he found 10 shot sounds, but he knew he had to limit it to eight so he wouldn't identify the final one. I mean, the intellectual dishonesty, and I don't know if it's dishonesty. Like, I don't know if the guy thinks he's lying or if yeah. it's just like this emotional un- inability to accept the truth that there were at least two gunmen firing, because that's the case. Now, in my research, it gets worse because a lot of people saw a visible flame coming out of uh-huh. Sir Hans' gun. And you don't see that when you're firing bullets. You only see a flame when you're firing blanks. That's what we see in Hollywood all the time. They use blanks for two reasons. One, it's a safety issue. But two, yeah. it shows like something coming out of the gun. And people right, are right, so right. used it's to seeing it. It's a visual representation. It. Right. And they're so, because otherwise it's like, it's much less exciting if there's no gunfire coming out. You don't know yeah. when the bullet went off or not. And, but in real life, there's no flame or anything coming out of a gun. It just well, goes I, off. I, I will say on the on the 22 that does seem. I mean, I have I have a rifle with a muzzle brake that does put out a a blast, a, a, a large blast of yeah. gas. But uh, I also I have a I have a 22 revolver. It mm-hmm. is a. I mean, it's just like a you know. And you fired it, gun. right? Yeah. I fired it many times, and uh, yeah, there's not a very um, it is not a very spectacular. Yeah, there might uh, be a little puff, you know, big, exactly, <laughs> it's like a little bit of smoke or something, but not yeah. a visible flame, not a shower of paper, and definitely not residue that look, you know, uh, Rayford Johnson, who was an Olympic decathlon champion, who you know participated in events started with a starter pistol all his life. And he said it looked like a starter pistol. It looked Mm. like a cap gun throwing off residue. And so there's that evidence too. There was also a number of sound witnesses who said it sounded like a cap gun. And we're talking people who were in the military, uh, the attorney general's assistant, you know, of the United States. I mean, high level people were saying it sounded like a cap gun, not just the mojo. Yeah. I think I think with here too is, is is when I first like read about this when I was younger and read that there were like different theories on this. It was a little confusing to me because I'm like, well, it's a small room, you know. Mm-hmm. There's dozens and dozens of people there. How do you not just like everyone just not see this guy shoot him? But yeah. I, I not you know if you think about it a little more, and especially you're know, reading a lot of the witness statements in here, mm-hmm. this is a very confused, chaotic scene. I mean, yes. even before any shots were fired. Right. RFK, you know, a a guy who just won the California primary is being basically led at his elbow by a uh, 
By the a only man other person who... with a gun in the room. <laughs> Um, yes. a security yes. guard, uh, yeah, security guard and, who I found out worked for the CIA, at least in later yes. years. And probably at that point, they knew Gene Caesar was working for Robert Mayhew and the Hughes organization at the time that Mayhew was basically the connecting point between the CIA mm -hmm. and Hughes. Hughes gave the CIA money for their operations. CIA used Hughes for cover for their operations. It yep. was somewhat of an open relationship, but on the other hand, when the CIA tapped Mayhew to run the Castro assassination plots, he didn't get permission from Hughes. He just did that. Hughes right. later is like, what? Are you involved in that? He's like, oh yeah, by the way, yeah. the CIA asked me to do this. Well, it's an open relationship. Yeah. Um. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mayhew was on CIA retainer the entire time. And in the CIA's internal report on the Castro plots, they mentioned that basically they had complete control over Mayhew. Mayhew wouldn't sneeze if the CIA didn't approve it. And so for Thane Caesar, his guy, to be there in the room, literally holding Kennedy. And I, yeah. I wish I had two of me here. <laughs> Because yeah, yeah. It's like well, I can act Thane it out in my little square. One arm, yeah, but, but Kennedy is shot under the very arm that, right. that Thane Caesar is holding. Caesar was like a big six foot kind of stocky guy. He could easily have fired those three shots, and no one would have seen because he could have hit it with his own body. And there, yeah. after Kennedy fell, there was a witness who was very distressed because he saw the security guard standing and pointing a gun down at Kennedy and not at Sirhan. And that freaked mm. that guy out, Richard Lubick, because he's like, why is he pointing there? Shouldn't he be looking for the shooter? And people have said, oh, Sirhan can't be firing blanks because that would mean there was yet another shooter in the pantry. Well, guess what? The story's been told inadequately for many years. And like I said, I literally read every pantry witness. I'm convinced there mm -hmm. were at least four guns in that pantry based on the descriptions I have read. One of them was right next to where Sirhan was. He was standing on the table. Then he jumped down and ran out. People saw him running away with a gun in his hand. And he even looked like Sirhan, but he was significantly taller. Taller. So again, if somebody saw just the face, they would have assumed it was Sirhan. But, you know, from the witnesses who saw this man, and again, there are like three or four of them, it's clearly not Sirhan. Sirhan wasn't on the table till he was shoved there. This guy was on the table before Sirhan was shoved there. And then it's like they kind of switch positions as Sirhan's being shoved down, this guy's jumping off. And here's the other thing that happened. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, the confusion, the shooting happened so fast. None of the cameramen, because all the cameramen had turned their cameras off. You know, they had those big old cameras they yeah, had to carry yeah, around in yeah. those days. And, you know, they they couldn't get them up and on in time to capture the shooting. It was all over in like 40 seconds. It went by so fast. And some witnesses in the in the lobby saw a guy running like for his life across the lobby and at that point, they didn't know Kennedy had been shot, so they had no idea why this guy was running, you know, like his pants were on fire and thought it was very odd and told the police about it later. Another guy ran into the lobby and actually got caught and handcuffed because mm. people were saying, stop him, get him. He's mm. got a gun. And yeah. if he did or didn't have a gun, uh, certainly that's been covered up. All right. It's possible he handed off the gun to somebody. There was what looked like a what they call a brush pass, <laughs> a high-speed brush mm -hmm. pass in the lobby uh, where it appears he might have switched with somebody. Uh, that man is named Michael Wayne. He's a highly suspicious character. He lied about people he knew all night. He collected press badges and then gave some of them away right before the shooting. Now, Generous guy. <laughs> if you're a collector, you don't just hand free things out. You keep them. That's the whole point of getting them. But at the em embassy hotel, I mean, at the embassy room, uh, a press badge is like an all-access pass. You can go yeah, anywhere absolutely. in the hotel with a press badge. And so it's a much bigger story. And even people who, like, say it is a conspiracy, they mm -hmm. want to keep it simple because two people seems easier to believe than, like, ten. <laughs> But in well, reality, yeah. this was an intelligence operation. And when you stage something like that, it takes a team. You have spotters. Yeah. You have people ready to clean up the evidence at the end. Somebody was seen digging bullets out of the wall in the pantry sure. immediately after the shooting that wasn't even the sheriff. I mean, it's like there were people who knew what to do, how to cover it up, and they moved in immediately. Yeah. So this was not a small little mob hit. This was a big deal. And they had to have plan A, plan B, and plan C 
and right. probably mm-hmm. D&E in place as well. That takes right. multiple, multiple people, both inside and outside, obviously, the surveillance units that would have had to have been there.